Source is a podcast made by women for women. We talk with a wide variety of experts, ranging from a sex therapist to the CDC and everywhere in between to bring you the stories you're only going to hear here. Our goal is to entertain and educate because it's more clear now than ever just how much we as women are doing as parents, as spouses, employees, just as everything. Don't miss out on being in the know. Subscribe to Soul Source wherever you listen to podcasts today. Leave us a review too because this part's really important. When you leave those reviews, that's how we're able to continue bringing you the content you love each and every week. So buckle up, Soul Source Society, because we're about to get started this course correct and that to me is the the art and practice of a fuck it all mindset it's not that you don't make mistakes or go back and do things you're not proud of but it's like can i at least have the awareness to know when something doesn't feel good and the bravery to take action hello ladies welcome to another episode of soul source with your favorite host me raquel lamel About a year ago now, I spoke with a woman named Beth Borgen. She was taking on a new leadership position at a college in Northeast Wisconsin. She was the first woman to ever hold that position, and she was shaking things up. She was changing the way that the college was running, making schedules more flexible as a woman, understanding women juggle a lot. And we talked about how she was able to have it all, in quotes. Now, traditionally, when we talk about having it all, many times what comes to mind is this perfect relationship, a house, a white picket fence, kids, dog, you know, successful career woman. And somehow the woman is able to juggle it all. Like for me, what comes to mind is that movie with Sarah Jessica Parker. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's called I Don't Know How She Does It. And that's literally like that's what having it all looks like for a lot of people. Well, It doesn't always look that way for everyone, and that's okay. Now, my guests today are redefining what it means to have it all as a woman, as a mother, a wife, a working professional. And these two ladies, I mean, they're freaking cool, guys. I mean, I am so looking forward to talking with Katie and Casey, two best friends who said, fuck it all in a pandemic, built their own empire that's helping women across the globe. Ladies, welcome to SoulSource. Thank you for having us. Thank you. That was such an amped up intro. I'm like, I need that just on replay every morning to remind me who the hell I am. Let's go. (laughs) Well, it's true though. I mean, you guys really are kind of really shaking things up for women in a lot of ways because there is this real pressure to, to have this perfect life and to quote unquote, have it all. Tell me a little bit about what made you guys kind of start down this road of redefining this. We call it, uh, in many women that we talk to, they get this, the restless discontent, something is stirring inside. It goes from, wow, this doesn't feel good to soul crushing. And there's usually, that's what we call the fuck it all moment. There is this pivotal moment where you as women, and I mean, I think this is true as people, but certainly as women, you're trying to please so many other external expectations, whether it's from community, family, former self, you know, society, media, that there is a moment, a critical point in every person's life, but we are hearing it from more and more women where they say, I'm going to choose myself and it's going to disappoint a lot of people. It may not live up to what I thought it all was, but it's the only way I can survive. It's the only way that I'm going to make it to tomorrow. And that was the, that was my story. It was the synthesis for, or the catalyst for this business. So a bit of context 2020 pandemics happening, right? Um, Mm -hmm. We are all surviving. We are all uh, existing amidst a tremendous amount of uncertainty. I was a new mom. My daughter was less than a year old when the pandemic hit. I am married. My husband was doing an MBA. So first of all, let me acknowledge all things of tremendous privilege. So I want to give that giant asterisk because the pandemic was so um, critical and awful for so many other people in just like surviving ways. So I, mm-hmm. I give that disclaimer, but it, um, well, actually the story starts a little bit before then December, 2019, my daughter was six months old. I was a senior vice president in a consulting firm. I had done all the things Katie and I met 10 years ago, and I had been on a sprint since those 10 years to do all the damn things got the guy, got the house, got the two dogs, um, had the kid, had the career, had the income. And I think on paper, and even now I talk to so many of my former colleagues, they had no idea that I was struggling. And I was six months postpartum. I had come into a job with more responsibility than I had ever had before returning from becoming a new mom. My whole perspective and value system had shifted in a really wonderful, but also challenging way. 
And I wanted to drive my car off the road. It's very episodic. I can see it so visibly in my head now, back in December, 2019 of just feeling like, I don't know if I want to kill myself, but it'd be great if I didn't have to be responsible for all the things that are asking for my time and attention. Mm-hmm. And the, the face you just made is what I have seen from so many women and men candidly, but so many women that say, I, I definitely have felt that I have thought that exact same thought. And that to me, like when we start talking about wanting to physically hurt ourselves or, you know, change things so drastically and multiple people say, yeah, me too. That's alarming. There is something so flawed that that is how we are getting because so many of these people that make that exact face you did, they're educated. They have, they have options. They are, have lots of support. They have the means to do and be different, but this pressure to be and live up to some expectation is what is crippling. And so uh, November of 2020, I had left my job. I made the decision and we can certainly get more into that, but I want to get down to more of the, the it all piece of it. I had made the decision to leave and I started just asking, Katie was a catalyst for this. She, and she'll share more of her story, but it was women in my life who were living life on their own terms. They It's not that they didn't struggle with the pressures or expectations, but they were saying, I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to choose my mental health. I'm going to choose what serves me. And I thought, wow, I want to, I want to live more. They're inviting me to live in my power. I want to live more in that way. And so I started asking the question, what does it mean to have it all? It was really an introspective journey. Where did these things come from? What were these beliefs formed, you know, down to when I was a little girl or in college or recently married and there was a lot, we say just as much as we're learning, most of our learnings are unlearnings. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, um, that was the start of it. So I started asking, my goal was to say, you know, can I speak with 10 women around what it means to have it all? And I was really angry. Like, uh, you know, the, whatever the 12 stages of grief, I was in anger. <laughs> um, and I was like, fuck it all. Fuck whoever told me this. Like I was pissed. And I reached out to my network and within a week I had a hundred women that said, I want to tell my story, or I want you to meet my friend or my sister or my mom or my colleague. And this to me was okay. There's something here. Like I'm not the only one asking this question. And that was, um, you know, we're in middle of October, 2021. And so we're coming up on a year of asking and trying to answer this question and unlearning a ton along the way. That unlearning piece, I mean, there's something to that. I know I've talked with you a little bit about this too, Casey, before we even got on this interview, but, um, you know, like like the box checking, you know, and you think that that's what you're supposed to do is hit all of these boxes and then you'll be happy. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and, and how the way that, I don't know why we're wired that way or why that's such a common thing, but that happens to a lot of people, especially women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot, of, we talk a lot about narratives. Um, so we are storytellers at our core um, from just background, our education. Um, and so many of these narratives are things that we hear from the time that we're born. I mean, truly. Uh, and I mean, even as kids, you're planning, you know, it's the movies you watch, it's the stories you read, it's the things your parents tell you. And, um, and it's, and it's also, you know, just a lot of like older narratives we were talking about, like women in the eighties saying at, at first it was like, women can have it all. You can be a mother and be at home and you can also have this career. And it became like, you can have this too. You must have this in order to have value. Um, and so now women have to do all the things and check all the boxes in order to be valued in society. And so I think so many of those, those narratives are where the box checking comes from in order to achieve success as we define it. Yeah. And to build on that, I think that it's a, um, many of these things to Katie's point start out as good intentioned. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, because we live in a society that's fast paced, that wants to oversimplify, fit things into different boxes, things that are incredibly nuanced, um, like being a human and like being a mother or like being a woman or like being a partner, all of these things that have incredible complexity, we try to oversimplify. We don't give the space and time for a story to truly be told. And so that just like she said, you can became you must. 
the option to be a mother means not just be a mother, but be like a fucking excellent one. And like, don't ever screw up and make sure you're still like attractive and your husband cares for you or your partner cares. Like Mm -hmm. it becomes somewhere along that spectrum. It oversimplifies. And because we are so as a society achievement oriented, and this is not, as we go through, we'll talk a lot about masculine and feminine. No, this is not men against women, but this is really the, the idea that within every person is masculine and feminine, um, makeup, energy, et cetera. And so just the way our society, um, education systems, careers, value has been placed, it is a very masculine mindset. And what we have come to realize is there's really strong feminine parts of us. And for me, that was woken up when I became a mother that made me start questioning things. And so our goal is not to tell women that, hey, you have to fuck the system and like, here's a totally alternative way. What our goal is, is can we just amplify that there is more than one way and allow women the time and space to be intentional and thoughtful, ask questions and not feel this idea that you have to check that one plus one must equal two for you, that you have to check the box in order to get there. What would happen if you have a moment to reflect and be intentional and find what serves you? And then maybe, you know, it's not, you're just reaching two, you're reaching 10 because you're really playing into your gifts, your strengths, the things that make you feel whole. Um, and that's, that's where we want to challenge that idea of just, you know, there are a certain number of boxes that fit for everybody because aren't we so much more nuanced and complex than that? We talk a yes. lot about being in your power rather than being in a perceived position of power, um, particularly in Washington culture. Um, you know, so much of our value is defined by, you know, uh, a successful job or how much income you make or, um, you know, your different roles in the community, um, or even in your household. And so I think so much of that is helping women step into their own power. So they feel really comfortable to own exactly who they are and their own story and what they've chosen for themselves. I think that's so, so cool. And so, so right on with where things need to be right now, because like, I mean, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I personally feel like a lot of the way that, um, society is structured is is almost dated you know i kind of feel like we're like back in like the 50s with what worked when it was one person working outside of the household and that is not the case anymore and so finding ways to to redefine like you said this having it all does not mean what it meant you know 50 years ago it's not the same thing Completely. We're working on a body of research right now, exactly tying into that is where do these beliefs come to be? I think so often when we start asking questions, it feels like, oh, that's a quick answer. And then you just keep asking the five whys for anybody that's been in, you know, um, business or consulting or any of those five whys. And then you start revealing like, oh, this shit is deep. Like it, it goes so <laughs> much further. It goes back to our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. Like you start seeing these generational shifts and that has been, um, it's been fascinating for us, but also just, it's been, um, it's been humbling to realize the complexity of it. These are systems that are hardwired and so they're going to take time and a lot of conversation and a lot of transparency that requires an incredible amount of vulnerability and bravery. And we, we just tell ourselves all the time when we step into our power, we invite others to do the same. And I think that's one of the things you're doing here with this show is how do we, um, how do we show women in that place and then allow others to say, Oh, I, I too could do that. This might look different for me, but where is my power? And so, um, it's these conversations, they're just, they're so, so powerful. So Casey, you shared your story with us a little bit and it's very, um, you know, what you would think when you traditionally think having it all, but Katie, you have a very different, um, situation. Tell us how you got to your fuck it all moment. (laughs) Um, well, I think I've had several fuck it all moments over the course <laughs> of my life. I think, I think that's just it. They're, they're truly kind she of, she has a fuck it all mindset. We'll get into what that <laughs> means. I'm sure. But I always yeah. say I have moments. She has a mindset and I've been so blessed for over 10 years to have her in my life, like showing me and modeling what that can look like. Um, I, I feel like maybe I've always been someone that's a little bit gone to the beat of my own drum, but I, um, I definitely have the restless discontent, um, that has pushed me to, uh, travel and live in different places over time. And, um, I, I guess more recently was in a seven year relationship. Um, and when that ended, um, in 2018, I, uh, today, (laughs) yesterday was three years ago that you moved abroad. Yeah. Um, I moved to Thailand. So, 
um, in that, I guess I, I kind of saw my life. Um, I was actually engaged and, um, I kind of had this, I guess, path laid out before me, a life I think I could have been very happy in. Um, but when it all kind of came crashing down, I, um, I actually was seeing a therapist at the time in order to just, I think, transition, um, through that process, um, because there was some mental health situation involved. And, um, she asked me, how do you want to respond to this? And I said, with love. Um, and so looking at that, I just kind of wanted to, um, to tie up everything as, as well as I could and walk away from something and be really proud of it. And also so grateful for the time that I got to spend with this wonderful individual, because I learned so much about myself. Um, and I, I just truly believe that like, there is no such thing as failure. They're just lessons, um, that we're meant to learn over time. And, um, and so I took that opportunity. I had so much restlessness inside of me because I was trying to fit into, I think, a very small town Southern community that had a very specific way of the, like how life looks. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it wasn't really, it wasn't really working for me, but I was really trying to pretend like it was. And, um, when I finally was set free, I guess you could say I was Isn't like, that beautiful. this is my, this is, this is me. I'm out of here. And so, um, I knew that I wanted to, um, have more international experience because my background's in international studies and, um, and I knew that I could apply my skill set um, in that kind of setting. And so I applied for a job. I moved three weeks later. Um, while I was there, I met an incredible, incredible community of women um, who were really doing life differently. And um, it was really nice to have, I think, a mirror for maybe the first time in my life of women who some were married, some were not. Um, many were in their mid-30s. Um, they had very successful careers in the humanitarian sector, um, and were just kind of walking a different path that I hadn't seen modeled in a very long time, um, living where I was living. And so that was really empowering for me. And I knew that I wanted to get a specific skill set and come back to the States, um, because I'm close with my family and, and wanted to, to, um, be back here. But I, um, I came back and fell right back into old patterns. I think I let go and I was like, okay, now I have to move to DC and I have to get a job that is on, you know, in leadership in some capacity. And, um, and then if I can do three to five years there, that'll give me the clout that I need in order to consult. Um, if y'all can't see, she just did air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I like fell right back into it being back in like Western culture mm -hmm. and, um, feeling like I needed a perceived position of power in order to be valued. And, um, and I tried that path and it just like, it seemed like the universe was telling me something different. And, um, I turned down one position that I was offered there and think, Thankfully, Casey called me in January and said, I'm building this business. Would you be willing to move to Atlanta and build this with me? And as somebody who's been in social impact for the last decade, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. And I am so passionate about women and their journey and, and empowerment. And, um, and so I made the jump here, um, which has been wonderful, but yeah, definitely a lesson, um, many times over. <laughs> And falling back into old narratives and habits, yeah. um, in order to kind of find your, your journey and your path, um, yeah. for sure. I think that's something that I've just, in you saying that as we were sitting here, I don't know if you've ever been to, or anybody listening, like a retreat of some kind, whether it's mm -hmm. like a corporate training or like a self-help and you go and you're like, I'm so Zen, I'm like so empowered and I've learned all these lessons so I'll give it like, um, maybe you go to a work retreat, like a manager training and you're like, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be the boss and I'm going to be amazing. And then you go back and within like three days, all the stuff in this Zen moment you had in another perfect, pristine environment has gone to shit. You maybe like implement like 20% of what you learned. And then the rest of the time you're like, what was that about? I see that as so much of that DC moment for you of we go back into these environments. And I think this is true of women or of humans, but I think certainly women, we go into this like 
subscribing to how do I make others happy? How do I consider their needs? How do I, and you, it's muscle memory. It takes over. And, you know, when you were in DC, it's like you had all these lessons from living abroad. You knew all of these parts of yourself you had learned, but it was so easy for that to overtake. And I just have loved in watching you, you and I were talking last night over the past, you know, year and a half, how much you continue to, to challenge, like, yes, I'm in this environment. And yes, I maybe did a week of the, the behavior I'm not proud of or not living my values, but it's this course correct. And that to me is the, the art and practice of a fuck it all mindset. It's not that you don't make mistakes or go back and do things you're not proud of, but it's like, can I at least have the awareness to know when something doesn't feel good and the bravery to take action? And I think that has been the number one thing I've learned is we're never going to get a pristine environment all the time, right? You're going to have triggers and uh, traumas and all of these things. But the goal is that can you develop a relationship with self so you can show up and, and know how to return there? And I think it's about, it's become for, for me, it's become about living my values and my values when I was living in the United States beforehand and in, in, in a kind of a long-term relationship, um, they were independence and truth. Um, and as soon as I like moved abroad, they almost became the opposite for their vulnerability and community. That's so different. Yeah. And so I think in that I was almost like trying to value the things that I felt I didn't have. Mm. And, um, and maybe that was my way of trying to control. Um, and then as soon as I got over there, I realized that like actually community is what fills me up. I don't need, I know that I'm independent. I already know that about myself. So I don't know why I was trying to like put that on a pedestal. Mm. Um, I think maybe I was trying to prove to everybody else, um, or maybe myself. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, vulnerability and being open to new opportunities and experiences and being again, willing to fail or, um, face rejection in some, and be able to reframe that and say, Nope, this is not actually my narrative. This is just saying like, Hey, wrong direction, a little bit more to the left. So that, that uh, not being afraid to fail piece, I think is so important because I, I do see a lot of women, I have personally have a lot of friends who've done this too, myself included. Relationship, for some reason, I feel like women, we really define our success and, and, and based on a relationship, right? Based on a guy. So if that falls apart, it's like everything has fallen apart. Any advice that you can give on that, Katie, about just, being brave enough to, to, to not be defined by that, because it is such a big piece for so many women. Yeah, I, I would, I definitely say that it's we're talking about that this morning. Yeah, we were, it's hard. I think like even in the dating sphere, it's hard. So, um, I, I think you want to feel that value and you want to feel that connection with an, I think that's innately human, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for sure. I, I think for me, I was really trying to focus. I mean, it was very painful when my relationship ended, um, and it wasn't in a point of anger. It was just, it was just sad. And, um, it was hard to like, let someone that you love go and not think, um, did I do something wrong? Like, is this about me? Uh, do am, like, am I bad in some way? Um, instead I tried to reframe that and say, like, these are all the things that I'm so grateful. And I love the most about myself because of this other person, um, and now I get the opportunity to go and explore and find out again, it was a, I knew exactly who I was, but it got to be a little bit of a rebuild where I got to push on my own boundaries. And mm -hmm. whenever I thought I could break, I could go further. And I think that was such a, okay, like you've got this, keep going. And then surrounding myself with community made that even easier, particularly women, um, because it became almost like a sisterhood where there wasn't, I mean, honestly, there wasn't a single woman I spoke to that didn't have my experience in some, in some way, even if it was more short term or they could just relate to my story and I could relate to a lot of theirs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really helpful just mm -hmm. to hear those, those different narratives. Um, and I think again, it is difficult because we are looking for connection as humans. Um, but it is like, you want to find, you want to find the person that supports you and fills you up. And I look at, um, you know, I look at Casey's relationship with her husband and it's something to aspire to, um, their communication and, um, and their, like his support of her and her journey and, and vice versa. Um, I feel like to me, they meet each other where they are. Um, 
And if you're not getting that from, you know, a significant other or even a friend, um, I think it's worth reevaluating those relationships. We give so much energy. Uh, we, I heard like in the last week talking about an energy budget. Um, it's our new favorite phrase. And I kind of love oh. that because I was like, we give so much energy to so many things, particularly as women, because we are these like incredible multitaskers and we have so many different identities. Um, and I think to really be intentional about where you give your energy um, in your relationships is imperative. Um, because we are so often the product of the five people we spend the most time around and you want those people to be extremely empowering and supportive and your cheerleaders and, and you want to be the same for them. I think something that I've come to realize in watching Katie go through her experience of leaving a relationship, finding this community, and then also my own experiences of being in a, a, a marriage, a partnership and having a child through all of this is that um, one, when things don't work out, or even if you're still together, but having challenges, most of the time, it's not about you. And I think as women, we are told so early, you have to be happy. You have to be agreeable. You have to be pleasant. You have to be the one that makes things smooth over. And these are narratives that we, whether it's in family of origin or in society or friend groups that we play that role. And I had a, um, a woman that gave, uh, I went to a training and she gave a card for whenever you're having a bad day to look at, like if, whether it was at the employees or whatever. And my card said, remember, it's mostly not about you. That has been some of the best advice I've gotten when relationships don't work out or you have friction with those that you love. This can be any relationship. Most of the struggle is about that own, that person on their own journey. And yes, you may have, you know, be recipient of that or feel those things, but it's not a commentary on who you are as a person. We had a wonderful guest on the podcast, very beginning, Lori Thomas Ross. And she said, this doesn't work for me. And that qualifier of for me is so powerful because as women, we often say this doesn't work. And that means that we are wrong, that we have to fix something in order to make it work. But it's very empowering to switch and say, this doesn't work for me, because then you're saying, this is what I need. And this doesn't meet those, those needs or boundaries. And I think that's just a, those small nuances. And that's what we were talking about earlier. The nuances are so important because that's how we form our beliefs. And that's how we show up in the world. The other piece, when it comes to a relationship or a partnership for me, I've had to come to realize that my husband while we have committed together to have this marriage and to raise a daughter, he is not responsible for my happiness. He is not the sole source of all the needs in my life from community to connection, to love, to intimacy. There are parts of it that we are responsible for together, but I have to take accountability and ownership and vocalize what I need in this world. He's not a mind reader and he is not my, he is not here to solve my problems. And that that has been something that I've, as I've worked through, you know, my own ebbs and flows over this past year, leaving a career, being the breadwinner, being a new mom, all of these roles, I've had to really come to terms with, you know, what did I give myself versus what did he give me? And most of the time it's things I gave myself, pressures, expectations, et cetera. And so I think that as Katie was saying, the five people I've had to also look and say, what are the relationships around me? What are the friendships? What are the family relationships? What are coaching and therapy? You know, what are the components that I need around me in order to be a good Casey? Because I, it's nobody else's to solve for. And, and finding that what makes you your best person and knowing when something doesn't work for you is, um, you know, it, it can be kind of scary, right? Because if you're, if you're going down a path and you're like, you know, this is what I need to do and you're unhappy, making a switch can feel like, I'm going to screw it all up, you know? So how, how do you do that? And is it, is it okay? On the, I mean, obviously it's okay on the other side. You two are sitting here to prove it, but I mean, how do you get past that fear barrier there that can really be pretty, uh, pretty strong? Um, I think we talk a lot about like fear is an important element in this. I think, um, it's, it's like imperative to have, you just don't want to let it drive. Like, I think it's, it's really about like keeping it in the backseat of the car. Yeah. Liz Gilbert says fear can come along, but she has to sit in the backseat. Yeah. And we love that. Yeah. And I think that's, um, I thought that was Brene, so good. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just, I, I think that fear is important because that's part of the journey and overcoming. Like that's where you feel really powerful when you're like, I did, I was scared to do that and I did it anyway. 
Um, and it may not always land in the best result. I mean, I think my story of DC is, is like, you know, I tried, I tried a path. It, it wasn't the one that was meant to take. And, uh, so I pivoted. And, and I think to say it was really hard. There were months where financially you were figuring it out. You had new relationships with a roommate and friendships during COVID moving to a new city. Like we can tell it now in hindsight, but in the moments, yeah, there it was, was crippling. Like, yeah, there's and there was an intense amount of vulnerability through that for sure. Um, yeah, and then to then to pivot again and say, okay, that didn't work for me. So what mm-hmm. what is the next um, what's the next choice that I think is going to to serve me well? And and I think there's a lot of fear involved in that, um, mm-hmm. but it doesn't make it impossible. I think also there's this idea that um, when we feel fear or pain, we want to escape it as soon as possible. I, yep. I am a fixer through and through. I love to make everybody feel good. If I can assume it, even at the detriment of myself to help somebody else. Like, and I think that is so true. So many women that we talk to in our, in our business. And what I have come to find is that you don't need to escape it. Um, we have a, a friend of, and fellow creator that says, love your demons. That's a, you know, a, a philosoph- philosophical belief. I think it's Buddhism, but it's, if you love your demons, then in just like you did in your relationship saying, I'm going to respond with love rather than resentment or fear or whatever, but I'm going to meet it with love. That's a, that is incredibly vulnerable. It is incredibly hard, but if you can do it, that fear becomes something that you can just cradle and understand so much better. And again, asking those five whys, we are so big on that of, you know, oh my God, I'm really scared about this, that we say barriers real or perceived and perceived is just as powerful as real tangible ones because perception's reality. Exactly. And so getting familiar with those of, oh my God, I couldn't do that because financially it's not going to make sense. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. What does it mean to be financially stable? Are there other ways? Are there ways that you could do something that isn't emotionally taxing, but meets your, your financial goals? Are there ways in cutting back expenses? Like, because that's often one we hear when people, especially from like a career perspective, um, does it mean that you have to do it today? Could you do it over a year? But you, the fact that you're making forward momentum is good. Are you looking for connection or creativity? And is there another place to get that beyond just the way you make money? These are things that when we've started to realize when you question anything in life, what, what it means to have it all relationships, career, you cannot go outward and start fixing things until you first go inward. Um, Elizabeth Lesser, her book, Cassandra speaks, we strongly recommend it for everyone. It's incredible. She'll be on our podcast coming up soon is there's this process of going inward, outward, onward. And you cannot do anything. I don't know if my partner is right for me or not until I go inward to say, what does a partner need to be for Casey? Like Mm. that. And so I think as women, as people, right, you're in pain, you so quickly want to get out of it. You just reach for the first thing, Mm -hmm. but it might be a symptom you're fixing, not the problem. We talk a lot about living in the mess. Yeah. It's really fucking hard. Yeah. It's really hard. (laughs) It is. It is. Honestly, you get out of it faster. I think if you're willing to sit with it and say like, what is this pain point? And instead of just like, first way out. It's very masculine energy to try to find the most linear, quick solution. But if you sit with it, there's sometimes multiple solutions. Um, and just to feel, feel your feels truly. And then you can identify and name what it is. And then honestly, like it might only take a day or two to come out of it versus what might be three months if you're trying to, to fight the demon. Yeah. 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 That's, that's such a hard thing to do, but it's like, it's like a learned behavior as is everything we're talking about on this. It is a constant retraining, but it it's worth it. I think the piece too, that we've come to realize is that none of this happens without a level of intentionality and life in general is very busy, very fast paced between our jobs and relationships and family and just general, you know, existence that you have to create that. And we've come to know our own practices, whether it's writing or meditating or taking a walk or grabbing a drink with a girlfriend or having coffee with my husband in the morning. What are the things that allow you that? And it doesn't, it would be great if it could happen by accident because we already have enough things on our mind. God, I have to schedule that too, but we would schedule anything else for someone else. Why will we not? And, and I can speak for my experience, especially with a young daughter, my daughter's two 
I will find every excuse in the world to give to everyone else in my family and my four walls to the point that I'm so depleted. And it's in those moments that I have to say, like, if I'm empty and we hear this so much, if I'm empty, I have nothing to give. It doesn't take much when I sit with the mess or sit with those demons, sit alone. It's just a few hours and I recharge, but as much as I know it, do I ever do it? No. (laughs) Absolutely. I have one other question for you guys. Um, Women, I mean, women get a rap for being catty, for being judgy, for being just, you know, you hear that a lot about women in general. And and so trying to to change this narrative and, and change the way that we look at, um, you know, happiness as as women and as society, what do you think women need to do? And do you agree with that, that women kind of do fall into those roles sometimes? So I think a lot of that we, are, we actually kind of have an interesting quote that came out of uh some work we've been doing in the last couple of weeks. But um, I think a lot of that is a scarcity mindset that we've been told that, you know, there's only a certain number uh, at the top and that we're almost in competition. Um, and somebody said to us a couple of weeks ago, um, if what would you do differently if you were playing to win instead of playing just not to lose? And um, Casey and I sat with that for a couple of weeks and we were thinking like, okay, in our business, what will we do differently? Yeah. How, where, where, where can we really bring the A game? Where can we level up? Where can we do, you know, we were like totally subscribed to yeah, it. Yeah, totally subscribed. And I was driving home um, from Florida and I was in my car and all of a sudden got super revved up and called Casey and I was like, what in the hell are we trying to win? And I was like, this isn't about winning or losing. And I was like, that's such a scarcity mindset. We want to lift all women up. We want to bring everybody. We want to celebrate everyone's successes. We're not trying to get to the top of something and push other people down because if someone wins, other people lose. And it's really like, there's plenty, there's plenty for everybody. We want, we want to lift women up. And so I think that's an unlearning, an old, an old narrative, an old mindset of like, if I have, you can't, you have not, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that's been a big shift in a lot of what we're talking about. And and I know that you went through that in your workplace as well, just with like, yeah. And a reframing of that might be, what would you do if you were being bold? Right. That might be a question to ask because it's about you on your Mm -hmm. path, in your power, not you in comparison. And that is the thing that we so often hear is that, um, right, you go to some of the books that have been published over the last decade, lean in, right? You've got that seat at the table, lean in. You're one of the few there. Well, our whole thing is like, fuck the fact that there's one seat at the table and we have to elbow our way through. Let's go build another table. Like, let's stop subscribing to that. There's this one singular way because what we've come to know is when we are in a place where we have to pretend or act or emulate some behavior that does not feel natural, we feel insecure, unfulfilled, not confident. And I don't know a single person on this earth that is at their best bringing their full boldness power when they are in that state. And so how are we as a society, as communities, as families, as workplaces, we are not benefiting from the full power of women when we put them innately as they walk in the door that you're, you should be insecure, that there is only one place because we are spending so much time competing with one another that we're not even doing the best damn job that we could. That mm-hmm. is such a, that is such a flaw. A, an example Katie was mentioning, this is something that really only in doing this business and starting to unlearn a lot of these things, I was able to articulate. I was head of sales in my former company. And so I was one, when I first started at the company, I was one of two women across like a you know 40 person organization. Then I was one of, I think like two women in leadership. By the time I left there, we were 50, 50 men and women. Awesome success, right? Like love that. Had an all female team of sales leaders. Very cool. But Even me, so I share all that to say, even me who feels very progressive, very aware of this, fell into a a totally, um, a narrative and behavior that feels so awful and not good to me that of course it can happen to any of us. Even so like, you know, I I was there. So um, I was a sales leader. There was another woman in the team um, who was doing very comparable work to me. I was... um, 
promoted, given a salary, she was promoted to a title adjacent to me, but was making, I think it was like $10,000 less than I was. At the time, my own story, Casey's, you know, blinders on, I was the breadwinner in my family. We had just bought a house. I was paying off hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. I knew I wanted to get pregnant and try for a child. So I felt all of these immense pressures that I need every dollar coming into this household because I'm trying to build this life. When I found out she made $10,000 less morally set really bad. I'm like, Oh, I do not like that. Should I go to my boss and should we, you know, have this conversation? The first thought that went through my mind is that she gets more, I get less. I think so many women can relate to that, especially in the business world. And Mm -hmm. that, and so I was really fearful. I'm like, no, we can't do that. Like, I'm really sorry that that's the case. How can we maybe work on your bonus? But I was so terrified because of my own baggage, not anything to do with my beliefs and values of pro women and equality. All of it was my own shit. And then after sitting with that, she and I actually then went instead to say, there's a finite pool of dollars in which the company can only give me less and her more, that that's the only way of operating. We then said, can we actually have an equitable salary and work together instead of us competing on accounts, work together to drive the business forward, splitting a larger pool of dollars. That was the eventual decision, but it took me months. It took me feeling competitive. It took me feeling pissed off of how did she respond to that client? That's mine because these were narratives that were perpetuated in the business that there was competition amongst us. And that may work in some environments that may motivate some salespeople. I will tell you, it is the most demotivating thing as someone who values community, values my colleagues, well-being and in it was crushing. And it was that shift that really made this environment eventually work for me. But there were times that I'm like this, I I am competing against an entire world. I can't compete against my colleague. I I find that so interesting because it's like, it's coming from a place of fear, right? We're talking about changing fear. It's coming from a place of fear. If you're, if you're competing and you're worried about losing out on money. And then it also, I'm seeing so many parallels here from what we're talking about of like, also talking about like you with the sisterhood, Katie, and, and, and needing other women to help lift you up and make you feel better. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're working together with your colleagues. So there's so many synergies going on here, ladies. It's, I think that only now we can look back and begin to feel that truly this is where we are meant to be. The fact that we are storytellers and have done it as part of our jobs, but not been our primary job. It's been part of, I think, who we are as individuals, what bonded us 10 years ago we met in school is that, but only now can we begin to put the pieces together. And there's something very, um, very hopeful about it when we go through struggles now to know that it may be another 10 years or 10 days or 10 months that we may be able to fit the pieces together. But it's a a tremendous um, exercise in patience and vulnerability. And I would say find good people around you because if I did not have Katie in this boat with me as I, you know, break down and build up on a daily basis, I I don't know that I would be able to sustain in the same way. And so I, I think that that power of community um, has only amplified over the past year. Yeah. And to be fair, that's almost what we're trying to build. I mean, it is what we're trying to build. It's, um, the more women we talk to and almost can put a vocabulary to what's going on between like the mass resignation from the workplace, in addition to, um, you know, just these, these critical eruption moments in life, um, women are having them all the time at all different ages. I mean, we're, we're talking to women in their sixties that are feeling the same way as women that are just coming into the workforce in their twenties. And, um, and so that's been really interesting because we kind of thought this was more of like maybe a millennial, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, after we've been in the workforce for about 10 years saying this doesn't work for me, but in so many ways, we're seeing women Mm -hmm. at all ages go through this and it's becoming a movement. It's, um, being able to put words to it and, and create this community of women that are saying, Hey, I feel that way too. Let's talk about that. Let me share my experiences. And the more people that come into that circle, I think the more it's, it's a catalyst for confidence, um, for women to, to step into their power and own, own their story going forward. On that note, let's talk about this podcast. You two are podcasters, just like I am here on soul source. So tell me about the podcast you two operate. The show is called Fuck It All, Modern Women Redefining It All. Like I said, November 2020, I was pretty angry. So the the whole fuck the world, fuck it all, you know, came pretty naturally. Now 
uh, I maybe feel a little less angry. I feel a little bit more at peace with it. I still get angry sometimes, but it to me was born out of this question of what does it mean to have it all? Who told us that, what we should have? And we very intentionally have chosen everyday women that, you know, it's one thing to look at these big names in the world, the Brene Browns, the Sarah Blakely's, these women that are having massive, amazing following and success, thought leadership, all of that. And they have a place but so often, especially as women, we say, oh, they, but their situation's different than mine. They got lucky. Oh, I, that, you know, there's one in a million and they are that, that scarcity mindset. And what we find in talking to these everyday women, your sister, your friend, your colleague, your mother, um, there is a relatability that comes with she is just like me. And I hear those same struggles and hearing them walk through that mess, being able to use Katie's words, put language to it, share in a very open place. And we have women who are on the other side of their fuck it all moments. We have women who are in the midst of it. Women who are like, literally, I just had it yesterday. I had one of my neighbors come on. She was like, I just got fired. And um, I feel like I'm having a fuck it all moment. Can we just sit down and talk about it? (laughs) That is one of our most listened to episodes. It was, there was no clean bow at the end, right? Sometimes we want the story and be like, she struggled and then she persevered. And this is just like, she's struggling, period. Mm -hmm. That is it. Or ellipses. And that to us has been the power of this. And so it started out as a question what it has turned into and talking to hundreds of women on the show and just in our, you know, own pursuit of understanding this as a body of research, it has felt like a movement as all of these simultaneous things happen. We are both professional women. We are both disclaimer, white, straight women. Like these are things that we need to acknowledge that in our own, you know, experiences that are limited, but our show has talked to women across race, socioeconomic, uh, sexual orientation, geography, And what we have come to realize, there are some universal truths that have emerged. The three big ones are, we cannot be what we do not see. So we feel this sense of, oh my God, I'm the weird one out here. That sense of I'm the weird one then leads to, as I mentioned earlier, feelings of unfulfillment, insecurity, lack of confidence that don't allow us to show up in our power. We're very careful to not say empowered because we are not giving anyone a power. It's within all of us. We are, are hopefully modeling something, inviting others to, to be bold and feel um, whether, where they are at their best. When you do that, you invite others to do it. And the third is systems designs, right? Systems perform exactly how they're designed. None of this is by accident. Women, people of color, any quote unquote other, other than a white straight male was not, the systems were not designed for us at work, at home, in our communities. And so when we walk in them and say, this doesn't feel right, you are not crazy. It isn't right. It wasn't built for you in this modern moment in time where we are incredibly nuanced, multi-hyphenates living so many versions of our, our life within one existence. And that is what we are trying to do is we don't have all the answers. And most of the time we don't even have the questions, but can we amplify these voices? Can we curate conversations and play to our respective gifts in order to, to be a catalyst, to use Katie's words, catalyst for confidence so that we can change the stories and systems that run our lives at work, at home, and in our communities. That leads me right exactly where I was headed with this was that, um, you know, if this is this is a, a movement and that movement, we could create change. Like what could happen here if everyone starts to kind of realize this isn't built for us? What can we do differently? Um, I think I think as Casey was referencing, we are like earlier, we have our inward, outward, onward um, is kind of our, our formula um, for our success path, I guess. And So much of that is that first turning in word and knowing um, what it is that you want for yourself and and what your it all truly is and and following like your heart. And then the outward is we're meeting so many women now that are saying that doesn't work for me or this is I'm going to own my story and I'm going to build and they are building, um, they are building from the ground up new systems, new narratives. Um, And that's so much a part of what we're trying to do is amplify those voices um, and our own documentary and our own journey through this as well. And then onward is when it's, it's kind of that movement component where women feel like we're, we're like on our path. Now we can turn around and bring other women with us. Call it a virtuous cycle, right? When you, when you feel something good, I mean, you think about 
any sort of phenomenon that's around a life change, whether it is spirituality, whether it is, you know, health and fitness, when you think about mindfulness, there is something that happens when you reach the other side of that, when you've experienced a little bit of that magic that you want to bring others along. And so that is what we, we see. And our goal is that it's not based on some sort of external validation of who and what you should be, but that it's based on what your own makeup is, what your own values are. And there is no right or wrong. We're all incredibly nuanced, complex human beings with very different experiences. But um, we hope that fewer people feel like, fuck, I feel really unfulfilled, unhappy. And if they do feel it, that they know that there are places and spaces to go to explore those things. And that there is a when we, I mean, there's, you think about all these marginalized group, if we collectively say here are other ways of being and model that we invite so many others to do it, including straight white men. Like we are not anti-men we are saying, and we talk to so many people who live in that space and say, I relate to these things too. We are just trying to model a different way of being and say, it's okay. If, if you feel that restless discontent, like you belong, welcome home. We're, we're a place for that. And uh, we, we feel so strongly that there's something innately wonderful and beautiful about feminine, feminine nature, um, feminine energy, the matriarch, the, um, that energy that, that has the potential to save the world in this moment in time. And we, we say women will save the world. Why? Because we birthed it. And we mean that not just in like, I love that though. (laughs) We birth communities, we birth friendships, we birth families and all, you know, Mm -hmm all different ways. And, and we just, we, there's a deep knowing that this is, um, this is the turning of a page, I think. And we are very grateful to be a part of a collective conversation. If people want to be a part of this community, they want to learn more, they want to get involved. They just want to, I mean, have a community of women around them who are struggling just like them, because we're all struggling. How do they find you guys? How do they find the podcast? Yeah. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Fuck it all podcast. Um, just like it sounds y'all, uh, <laughs> modern women redefining it all. You can also go to our website, it We've realized that this podcast fits within a broader narrative, a broader conversation. And how can we tell different stories wherever content is consumed? So we have a membership in which women can join, um, that membership gets exclusive content that it lets us know, you know, a, a marker of where interest is very often a, uh, a pilot group for new concepts, new content, and also for exclusive events. And so trying to figure out um, what is that groundswell of women that are saying, yeah, I, I feel seen and I want to join in on this. So it all media.co and we are on social media. Instagram is probably the most active channel for us. It all podcast. Fantastic. Well, ladies, I mean, I could talk to you all day long. There's so many, so many things to cover. So thank you. Uh, we definitely, we went over our time already. So <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here and I will definitely, I'm sure circle back with you guys down the road because our shows are so in line. So this is good. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing and for having us today. Thank you for listening. And if you want to hear more soul source, just subscribe to our show. We're available wherever you listen to podcasts and you can watch us too. We're on YouTube. Just look for soul source. Soul Source is brought to you by Red Shoes Inc., a leading agency specializing in crisis and strategic communications, media relations, social media, and so much more. To learn more about Soul Source and Red Shoes, visit us at redshoesinc.com.